Well, good morning. This morning, um, I would like to share with you one of the most exciting secrets that God revealed to me to help women, any woman in any part of the world. And I think I was the first woman that he, that he really has helped me first to share um, what I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to take you back to a time about eight years ago when um, I had been away overseas on some trips and I came home and my entire balcony was covered with caterpillars. And these were not just ordinary caterpillars, these were nasty caterpillars. And in fact, I'm going to show you a picture of what those caterpillars looked like. How did these make you feel? When you look at that caterpillar, how do you think I felt mm -hmm. when I came home and saw those caterpillars? I was horrified. There wasn't just one, there were hundreds of them all over the walls of my porch outside. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get in the screen doors. They were destroying my plants. The leaves in my garden had been completely eaten. And I was scared of them because these caterpillars are poisonous. They sting. Mm -hmm. if, you, if they got onto your arm, they would sting you. And if you're allergic, you can have a very bad reaction to them. So I was scared. And so the entire week, I was trying to find a uh, pest control people that could get rid of them. I was trying poison sprays. I tried to hose them down with water hoses. And the caterpillars wouldn't go. They, in fact, they looked like they were multiplying. And they were growing by the day, bigger and bigger. By the end of the week, I was really scared because it was almost a plague, an invasion on my house. And um, I, sh I did something that I should have probably done at the very beginning, which was I called some friends to pray. And I invited these friends to pray for me either at my house or to pray in their homes. Well, one of those friends turned up at my house the following day and she brought with her daughter and her daughter, her name's Kelsey. And Kelsey came with a big glass jar, it was a bit, probably twice the size of this glass jar. And she said, Miss Liz, can I collect your caterpillars? And I said, why would, why would this child be wanting to collect caterpillars? But I invited her in, I said, sure, I'll get you some rubber gloves. And off she went. And her mum and I stood and talked to my porch. Meanwhile, Kelsey was collecting all the caterpillars off the, the trees and off the leaves and off the porch walls. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I should have told her to bring the whole school because maybe that was God's answer to prayer, that they would collect the caterpillars this way. But also in my mind, as I'm talking to her mother, I'm thinking, why would a girl collect caterpillars that are so ugly? Now a boy, maybe. My brother, I could understand him doing that. Boys would collect caterpillars and put them in your bed, wouldn't they? But girls, not so much. So after I'd watched Kelsey for a while, this jar was full with these caterpillars. The whole jar was crawling. And I couldn't imagine anything worse being in my bedroom than a jar full of poisonous caterpillars. So I finally asked Kelsey, I said, Kelsey, why are you collecting such hideous caterpillars, what are you going to do with them? And she looked at me in such a childlike way and she said, but Miss Liz, one day those caterpillars are going to be butterflies and I love to watch them fly. And I just was stunned. I remember looking at her and going, wow, out of the mouth of babes. Because not once in that entire week had I ever thought about the scientific transfer that happens, the transformation that comes about a caterpillar that turns it into a butterfly. And the process is called metamorphosis. Complete transformation. I, taught, I learned it at school, but when confronted with the ugliest kind of caterpillar I'd ever seen in my life, my first reaction was to kill them. Well, I had done a lot of traveling around the world and God had shown me some of the most broken women of the world. And as I started off at the beginning, I was a woman who was broken. I was the one that experienced God's secret transformation process. And as I looked around the world, my heart would break. Women in brothels, women in, in uh, sex trafficking, women in drug trafficking, women who've been physically abused, child abused, um, women who are hiding pain that nobody else sees. And my heart had been crying, Lord, how do we help these women? Well, the day that Kelsey said to me that these caterpillars are going to be butterflies, at the same moment, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Liz, millions of my daughters are living like caterpillars and I want to set them free to fly. And I'm sending you to tell them how to get free to fly. 
So what I want to share with you this morning is what is that process? Because maybe you're one of those women that feels like a caterpillar today. But I want to tell you that that isn't what God's intention is for us. And so the caterpillar and the butterfly can teach us deep truths, but they can also give us real answers that change us. And that's the secret I want to share. And we have to find the answer when we go right back to the beginning. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, it says that in the beginning, God made man and woman, male and female, in his image. And he created them in his image so that they would multiply and bear fruit. Now, God is spirit. God is not a human being. He made Adam and Eve with a physical body, but he blew his spirit into them. But it wasn't the physical body that, that illustrated or was the image of God. It was the spirit of God in them. God's character in them is what made them like God. So if we look at, perhaps this is just an, an, an analogy. This is not God. Doesn't re is not even representing God. We're talking about spirit. And the butterfly, when you look at the butterfly, compared to what this caterpillar looks like, what do you think um, your reaction is when you see the caterpillar compared to the butterfly? How does the butterfly make you feel? Free. Free. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 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 Mm -hmm. Happy. Mm -hmm. Children want to catch butterflies, mm -hmm. don't they? There's something about them that is compelling and it, we're drawn to them. Caterpillars, on the other hand, we want to run away from them. These ones I certainly want to run away from. Well, the Bible says in the beginning we were created in God's image. There was something compelling about that. Think about God. Think about the characteristics of God. That God is love. God is light. God is life. In him there's no darkness at all. God is liberty and freedom. God is truth. God is holiness. God is the Redeemer. God is Father. God is Protector. God is Provider. God is Holy. God is kind. He is true. He is good. All of these characteristics, God put those in us because He put Himself in us. He breathed into us and He gave us life. The greatest thing of God is He is life and He's hope. Well, that's what Adam and Eve they had that in them. So here, let's imagine that this is God's spirit, represented by the butterfly. And here is the image. This little one represents Adam and Eve. Their bodies did not look like God, but their spirit was God's. And because they had God's spirit, they were able to communicate with them. They had joy, they had freedom, they had life, they had love. They had uh, goodness, they had truth, they didn't know anything about lies or evil, they knew nothing about pain and sorrow. But God had given Adam and Eve this little butterfly, these two little butterflies that had to multiply together. He'd given them a mandate to multiply. And it needed male and female to do that. And he said, go and multiply and fill the earth. Well, by doing that, every time a butterfly, human butterfly would multiply, they would be bringing God's glory because they had his spirit in them. So goodness and love and truth and light would, would fill the earth. God had an enemy. And God's enemy was called Satan. And he was a fallen angel. He was a fallen butterfly. He had been, he had been a special being in heaven. And he was a fallen butterfly. And he hated God. And he knew that he couldn't destroy God, but he didn't want God's image going out across the earth. So he came after God's children. He came after Adam and Eve. And that's how Satan often comes to us today. He will maybe not hurt you, but if he hurts your children, mama bear, you know what that feels like, don't you? He knew to hurt God, he could hurt his children. And so he came after us. Now the, the unique thing that God had given us was a free choice, a free will. He'd given us his spirit, but he didn't make us like robots to follow him. He said, I'm going to give you a will, and there's, you can have everything in this beautiful garden that I've created for you, but there's one thing that you cannot eat, because if you eat it, you'll die. You'll lose your wings, you'll lose your freedom, you'll lose your joy. And so Adam and Eve were in the garden, and they were enjoying it, until one day, 
Along comes Satan, and he was disguised. He must have been beautiful, or I don't think that they would have run from him. Or they would have run him from him rather. If he looked like this at the time, mm -hmm. they would have run away from him just like that. But he must not have looked like that. He mm -hmm. came to them in a way that they were attracted. And he spoke to the woman, and the man was standing next to her. And he started to tell her, God's a liar. God told you you'll die if you eat from that tree. You won't die. There's nothing wrong with that. Why would God prohibit you from having something that looks so good? So Eve starts to think about it. Well, it looks like it would be good. I could give that to my husband. It'll make us wise like God. And so she takes the fruit, she eats it, and she gives it to her husband. And here's what happened the minute that she did that. Just as God promised, if they ate the fruit, they would die. And at that moment, Adam and Eve <clears throat> lost their freedom. They lost their wings. <clears throat> and instead of having God's image controlling their lives and having communication with him in their spirit, God's spirit departed from them. And now they were left under the control of Satan's image. And they took on his image. Now the Bible tells us that Satan became a serpent. God condemned him to crawl forever on his belly. Caterpillars coming to life, crawling. They don't have uh, any wings to fly. They crawl. They have about six to eight pairs of legs. They chew leaves for their food. They have teeth to chew leaves. And many of them are ugly, and some of them sting, just as we saw, as I saw in this one. And from the moment that we decided to follow Satan, we took his image on. I like to use D words to describe Satan because one of his names is devil. And it illustrates his character. If you think about D words, he, he's uh, darkness. He's destructive. He's a destroyer, the Bible tells us. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's death. So by choosing Satan, we took on an image of death, separated from God, because God is life. And we could never get back to the life that God had given us in our own strength. Because you see, what separated us from God was our sin, was disobedience. And God cannot connect with somebody who is not holy because he's completely holy. Well, so what happens is from that day onwards, every single man and woman was born with that sin image, that sin nature. We were not born the way that God intended. Physical birth continued to happen, but the spiritual birth was dead in every human being. So here's what happens to us as humans. We are born like a caterpillar. We start out life in our mother's wombs. And we start out as an egg in our mother's womb. And funnily enough, that's where caterpillars start. That's where most life starts. In little tiny eggs, tiny, tiny eggs. And we're created when a male and a female sperm and egg come together and life starts. And that's the same for the caterpillar. And even at this stage, the Bible tells us, Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16, that every day of our life was written in God's book. Even although I was born as a caterpillar, his plans for me were still there. And he says he loved me, even at this time. Before I'm born, God loves me. God knows my name before I was born, well, in my mother's womb. And God has good plans for me. But I don't come out of God's, out of my mother's room, rather, knowing those plans. Because I'm separated from God. Instead, I come out of the womb as a caterpillar. Now, I have a physical human body, and some of us are born and we're beautiful, and some of us are maybe not so beautiful. We're all in different shapes and sizes, just like caterpillars are. But the same thing that's true for all of us is we do not come out born with God's spirit in us. The gap that was left in us where God departed makes us hungry. And we want to find potential. We want to know who we are. And so we try to find our identity. And as we grow, we have to eat. And caterpillars had to eat. I watched caterpillars destroy my entire garden. Everything in the garden was eaten. Caterpillars are hungry. Babies are hungry. They eat and eat and eat. And as we grow up as adults, we get more hungry. And we eat and eat and eat. And that food just makes us bigger. It doesn't change us. It doesn't make us into a caterpillar. Sometimes we start trying to feed our, our hearts and our minds with things that we think will make us better, that will help us find that potential that somewhere deep inside us we know we've lost. 
And so it might be, what kind of things would we try and fill our hearts and minds with to fill emptiness? Knowledge. Knowledge. Activities. Possessions. Activities. Activities. Mm -hmm. Eating. Eating. Mm -hmm. Drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we fill ourselves up. And sometimes, some of us have had very difficult lives. And we don't know how to get out of that. And it feels very painful. And maybe some of you can identify with the fact that if you've been through abuse, you've been through brokenness, rejection, betrayal, you might have been born and not know who your parents are, and you just feel like, my life's never going to change. It's just, it's a pain, and it's, it's rejection, it's abandonment, it's fear. Or maybe you're going through education and it's not filling you. Or maybe you have a great job, but it's not enough. It might be money, you can never have enough of it. Because those things in themselves are not bad, but they never make us into a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And all of us are trying to find out, who am I and what am I doing here? I think that's the question everybody wants to know. Who am I and what am I doing in this world? And so we keep trying this quest to find that. And really what we're trying to do is get back to what we lost at the very beginning, which is God's identity in us. And you know what, it doesn't matter how much we eat, we will never, ever change from caterpillars in our own strength. Mm -hmm. But there is an answer, and that's where the secret is. That God doesn't want to be a secret. He wants to make it known, but so many of us don't know about the secret. You see, God saw that we could never change ourselves from these caterpillars into butterflies. We could never get back to God. And some of us try religion is a way of us trying to get back to God, trying to get to the place that we lost in Eden. We try our good works, we go to church every Sunday, we make idols, we, we do things that we think will help us connect with God. It won't, because it's a matter of our hearts. And so God had a plan from the beginning. And he said, you'll never be able to come up to me, so I'm going to come down to you. And so one day, God took off his wings. And he became a man. He limited his power. And he left that incredible place that we can never imagine called heaven. And he came down to our world in the body of a man. He took on the image of sin, which is a caterpillar. But inside he was God. He was still God. He was pure. He was holy. He came in a man called Jesus. And he lived on this earth for 33 years. And he came to tell us good news. And he said, I've come to give good news to the poor. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I've come to set captives free. I've come to open the eyes of those who are blind. I've come to open the doors for the prisoners. Those of you who are mourning, I've come so that you can rejoice again. Those of you who have a heavy spirit, I want to take off the heavy spirit and I want to give you a garment of praise. And Jesus spread that message everywhere. He said, I'm coming to tell you about God's kingdom. And the more he told people about it, people followed him. They wanted to have it. But even telling them about it wasn't enough to get rid of the image of sin and the crawling and the character of Satan that was in men, that was controlling us, that was in every single one of us through our births since Adam and Eve. And there was only one way that the power of Satan could be broken, and that was Jesus had to die. God himself had to die to destroy the power of Satan because our disobedience demanded a punishment. We disobeyed God and there had to be a punishment for that. And Jesus took the punishment. And so he allowed men, we, who he created, he allowed us to kill him and put him on the cross. And that was God's plan from the very beginning. There was no mistake in that. God had planned that that would always be the way. And so God allowed Jesus to die on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, it says in Colossians chapter 2 that our sin was nailed to that cross with Jesus. And that Jesus triumphed over every power of Satan. And he didn't stay on the cross. They took his dead body. He said when he, when he died, he said the work is finished. He'd done the work on the cross that he came to do, which was to destroy the power of sin. And then they put him in a tomb. And his body lay there. And while he was in the tomb, the Jewish people 
who had the leaders had been responsible for putting Jesus on the cross, they were afraid that he'd come out. Because if he came out, it would, it would make them liars. Jesus said he was God, and they didn't believe that. They said, he said he was the Messiah, they didn't believe it. And so they said to Pilate, the governor who had given permission for Jesus to die, we need to put extra covering on that, on that tomb. We need to seal it, we need to put guards, and Pilate, the Roman official, said, go ahead and do that. So they put extra sealing around, they sent angels, uh, uh, sorry, soldiers to the tomb, <laughs> and they had guards there, and they said, you'll never come out now. But God... God sent an angel and he removed the stone and he brought Jesus out of the tomb. And when Jesus came out of that tomb, he was no longer in a human bodily form. He was in human bodily form, but it was a resurrected body. He was walking on earth in a human body, but he was fully God and he was resurrected. And he even said to his disciples, don't touch me because I'm in my resurrected body. And they saw his hands and his feet. They knew it was Jesus, the man that had died on the cross. And he said, whoever believes in me will not die, but will have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to die, so that whoever believes in him will not die, but will have everlasting life. That's good news for you and me. Because there's hope, there is a way out of the caterpillar life. I don't have to live in bondage, I don't have to live in pain, I don't have to live with this broken identity of shame and, and the feeling that I'll never change who I am. There's a way out, and it's belief. We got into trouble in the Garden of Eden because of what we believed. We doubted God and we believed a lie. And Jesus Christ has come back to show us truth. And his truth is that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And whoever believes in me will never die, but will have everlasting life. So my first question to you today is, what do you believe? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about who Jesus is? What do you believe about Satan? These are important questions that every single human being needs to answer. We need to find answers. If you want to know how to change, the answer is we have to follow the path that Jesus followed. I have to die to my old thinking. I have to die to my sin. I have to say, Lord, it's no longer my will. I want to follow your will. But that's a surrender. It means I have to go into a cocoon because the caterpillar changes in a cocoon and that's a difficult process and when you start to take the step towards that sometimes it feels like it's very dark and very lonely when I look at this picture of the caterpillar I think will he ever come out will she ever come out just like they thought Jesus might never come out. Sometimes our problems are doing I'm going to surrender, but what if Jesus doesn't bring me out? What if I don't come out? What if I surrender and nothing happens and I don't change? But you see, the Bible says, but God. And the first step for me to experience transformation is to say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what it means, but I choose to believe your truth. And I choose to say, I want you to change me. You can come and bring me out. Jesus came out of the tomb and he was a new creation. He was a resurrected body. And when you and I put our trust in Jesus Christ, when we ask forgiveness of God for our sin and say, I'm receiving what Jesus did on the cross to pay for my sin, I want to receive that by faith. I change my belief and I'm going to put my trust in you, not just in my head, but now I have to believe in my heart. Because the Bible tells us it's what I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that will bring me transformation and salvation. And so, here's what happens. Because I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I take on his image. Jesus said to a man in the Bible, Nicodemus, you must be born again by water and spirit. And see, when I say that, when I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is going to be my Lord, I want him to come and live in me, 
God's spirit now comes to live in me because God has dealt with the sin through Jesus. I'm no longer a caterpillar in my spirit. Now I'm free from that and God comes to live in me and now I have his image back. What does that mean? I had death, I had darkness, I had destruction, sadness, pain. Now if God's spirit's in me, what does that mean is living inside of me? I have hope. I have hope. Life. Life. Love. 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 Freedom. 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 Light. Now I'm walking in light and freedom. I'm not the same. The Bible says, I am a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Well, because I'm a new creation, I need to learn what it means to live as a new creation. If I go and live in a different country, I need to learn how to live in that country. How they eat, what they wear, what their policies are. It's the same with God's kingdom. I've now been transformed from one kingdom to another, and now I need to learn what God says. And the Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, you are my disciples if you live in my word, and you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Butterflies don't eat the same food as caterpillars. Caterpillars eat leaves. What do butterflies eat? Nectar. Nectar, honey, from right from the best part of the flower. And they have long straw-like tongues to eat the nectar. They don't have legs, they have wings. They're not ugly, most of them are very beautiful. They may not all look beautiful to us, but they all have wings. And they all have tongues to suck nectar. And you might come out as a Christian and think, well, I don't feel like anything's different. I'm the same, my circumstances haven't changed. But you have changed because God's spirit lives in you now. And he's giving you power to fly. And that power comes as you believe his spirit and you feed his spirit in you through the word that he's given us. And when you know what his truth says, which sets you free, he then starts to show you what kind of butterfly you are. Because we're all different. And he's created a purpose specifically for you. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that God had created those good works for us even before we knew Jesus, even before we were born, that we will never find those good works until we know Jesus Christ. So we can be looking for our purpose in every kind of place of life. We'll never find it until we know Jesus because once I know him, I have his heart and spirit in me and he shows me what his path is and his plan is for my life. All those days of his book that are written, he starts to reveal to me. And what he reveals to me is that my life as a butterfly goes in two or three different places. The first is I have to spend resting time with him. I rest on the flower, I drink his word, I spend time with his friends, I pray, and I learn to have a relationship with Jesus through his spirit who's living in me. And then as his spirit fills me, he says, now go out and multiply, just like he did in Genesis to Adam and Eve. Now he says to us, Go and multiply. Go and tell others about the secret of freedom. Go and tell others about how they can have joy. Go and tell others about how they can be transformed. Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples. Now, most of you in here are Christian women, and you may never have been told how to be a disciple. And for me, it was the hardest thing to know, how do I share with women? I don't know. This helped me. The little butterfly helped me understand what it means to be transformed to be converted into a new creation and then my purpose is now I need to go and tell other women. It's good news and the best news of all is a verse in Colossians 1 verse 13 and it says that we who have believed in Jesus and been transformed through metamorphosis completely changed, we've been delivered out of the power of Satan into the kingdom of the son of his love the kingdom of the Son of God's love. So that, what does that mean for you and me? It means I was living in bondage. My old condition was death, fear, trap. I was a slave. But Jesus has changed that. When I believe in the cross of Jesus Christ and what happened, that power on the cross broke the power of Satan. And Jesus triumphed over Satan. I don't fight Satan. Jesus does. And when I trust in him, he stops the power of Satan in my life. And he says, I'm going to change you and give you my spirit. And he says, I'm going to change your position. You're no longer a slave to Satan. You're my daughter. You're my son. And, one, and John chapter 1 verse 12 says that we are children of God when we believe in Jesus. 
and he gives us his heart. See, I can't love others with my own heart. I have this human heart that, yeah, we can love each other, but it's not the same as God's love. God's love is unconditional. It helps me to love people even when they don't love me. It helps me to love others when I just don't want to forgive them. Because I don't love them myself. It's God's spirit in me that lives through me and helps me. And I can never go backwards into this kingdom. Have you ever seen a butterfly that has transformed into a caterpillar? <laughs> has it ever happened? Never. Never. No. I think it's happened twice. Somebody maybe suggested three times. Once, when Adam and Eve were butterflies. Mm -hmm. They lost their wings. And then Jesus, who was God in heaven, he chose to take off his wings. He limited his power and his freedom by coming down in a human body. Now, Satan, he was living with God, and he lost his wings through sin and rebellion and pride. So maybe there's three examples there. But I've never seen a caterpillar in, this, in our natural world ever change back in, into a, uh, sorry, a butterfly change back into a caterpillar. And as much as that's impossible, it's impossible for us who believe in Jesus Christ to be ever pulled back to this side of the cross. Satan's power cannot pull you because the power of the cross is a barrier, it's a wall to stop Satan. There's only one way that can keep you feeling like you're under Satan's power. And it's right in here. And so what we want to talk about further, if you are interested, because many of us live under bondage of Satan, even as Christians, even those of us who have taken Jesus as our Savior, we struggle, we struggle. And the lesson is Paul, one of the apostles in the Bible, he says, we have to be transformed in our minds, because that's where the battle is, right there. I am transformed in my spirit, but the enemy wants to tell me I'm not. And I have to learn what God's word says is truth. And so tonight, I would like to put two questions to you. First question I'd like to ask you is, are you a caterpillar or are you a butterfly? Where are you in this picture? Maybe you don't know, maybe you're not even on one of these pictures. You're going, well, Liz, I'm way back. I think I'm in a cocoon somewhere. Maybe I'm halfway in the middle. I'm not sure. There's a different cycle at each stage of the journey. Where are you? If you're a caterpillar, would you like to be a butterfly? Caterpillar means that you're still living under the control of Satan. You don't have freedom. You're on a path to death. And you cannot change yourself, no matter how good you are and no matter what you're doing. You are never going to be good enough for God. And you will never have eternal life. Today, Jesus wants to settle that with you. He has the answer. And if you would like to pray with me, at the end we will pray. And you, in one simple prayer, can confess your sin and ask Jesus into your heart. And you will become a woman transformed like a butterfly. But there's a second group of people in this room. And that's a group of women who maybe are already butterflies. You say, I, I already know Jesus is my saviour. I know what you're talking about, Liz. I've already done that. Well, here's the question to you. Are you living like a caterpillar or a butterfly? There are millions of women around this world sitting in churches who, who have asked Jesus into the heart to be their saviour, but they still don't know what that means. They don't understand what that identity is that Christ has given us. We don't understand that God has given us everything we need to live in this world and overcome, by faith, the problems in our lives. We don't understand how to live in a situation where people are hurting us, and instead of feeling angry towards them, we can treat them with love. We can forgive with God's help. So are you one of those women? Maybe you say, well, Liz, you know, I don't deal with those things, but I am a butterfly, but I have no idea how to reach another woman. And there are women all around me that are hurting, that need Jesus. I know, I see a neighbor that I meet with her, and I just don't know how to help her. Well, here's what I would like to encourage you to do. We have some different information and tools that can help you, but really, I would like to take you through the journey of how to be transformed, how to live in a place where you have that freedom and how you can share it with other women. And if you would like to know more about that, I would like you to come and talk to me afterwards. We're gonna have a sign-up sheet here, and we're gonna to get together. And we're either going to do this in a three-day workshop or we might do it in a, one, a, once a, a week, weekly meeting. 
Um, but we have various options. We have some different things that I would like to share with you here. Um, we have a book here called Transformation, which tells the whole story that I've just told you. You can also order these on our website, www.loveunveiled.org. Or you can call our number, which is in Orlando, Florida, 407-385-3925. If you're calling from outside of the United States, then you would put a one, a plus one in front of that, plus one, 407, 385, 3925. And we have these books to order which will tell you the whole story. We have a whole curriculum of teaching that's three years that takes women through how to live like a butterfly and how to help other women live like butterflies. Our heart is to help women be the women that God wants them to be. That's the purpose of our ministry and our vision is to reach the whole world in our generation by reaching the world's women. But we'll only do that when Christian women are equipped in God's word and empowered by his spirit.